Amen. So keep your place there in John chapter 1. So we're going to start um, a new Bible study through the book of John um, this evening. We're starting in John chapter 1. We're only going to get through about verse 14 um, this evening because I really want to focus on the first part um, of this chapter. Now I will often um, send people to the book of John who have just started um, reading their Bible. Uh, the book of John, of course, is one of the Gospels, and it's the, the Gospel that focuses the most um, on Jesus being God. Uh, many of the Gospels focus on um, different things, but um, the book of John really focuses on um, the deity of Christ and who Jesus um, really is, and that's um, the title of the sermon this evening as we look through the first couple verses in the book of John um, is, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus is what we're going to look at in depth tonight, and hopefully I can show you um, as we look through these first few verses in the book of John, I can show you the importance tonight of reading your entire Bible. Because you'll see, as we go through these verses in the book of John, uh, there's, there's cross-references all over the Bible on who Jesus actually is from Genesis all the way to Revelation. So that's what we're going to look at this evening. I'm going to give you two pairs of things that Jesus is from John chapter 1 in these first few verses. So let's start reading. Let's look down at John chapter 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So right away, if, you're, uh, if you've read through your Bible, um, and you've read you know, the, the Bible cover to cover, I mean, you see something familiar there, um, where the Bible starts out in John chapter 1, saying, in the beginning. Just like the Bible starts out with those three words. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. That doesn't mean the beginning of this time. That means the beginning of the creation. In the beginning was the Word, the Word. You just notice this, these two words that are together three times in verse number one. The Word, the Word, the Word. So in the beginning was the Word, meaning the Word was there um, before the creation. The Word was with God. So the Word was, was there with God. And the Word was God. Okay. So a lot of people don't believe that Jesus was God. Well, you know, here it is right here pointing out that Jesus is God. Look at verse number two. Look at verse number two. The, the Bible says in verse number two, it says the same, the same meaning, what is the, what is the two words the same in verse number two refer to? The same means, the, it's, is referring to the word that we saw three times um, in verse number one. So it's saying in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same referring to the word that we just talked about in verse number one, was in the beginning with God. So again, he just is repeating this again to get the point across. The Word of God is getting the point across that the Word, whatever that is at this point, we don't know yet because we have to keep reading, but this Word was in the beginning with God. It was there. Okay? Look at verse number 3. All things, now we see something new in verse number 3. It says, all things were made by Him. Who is Him? Him is the same. Him is the Word. This is what we're talking about here. So it's saying um, that the Word was in the beginning, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same is talking about, again, it says, um, referring to the Word, it was in the beginning with God, kind of repeating something there. And then all things were made by Him. All things were made by what? By the Word. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Word equals Him in verse number 3. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get you to see. Now turn to Genesis chapter 1. Now turn to Genesis chapter 1. So the first pair, we're talking about who is Jesus, all right? We know in, in a coming verses, I'll just give it away for you, the word here is Jesus. Um, the Bible explains that to us in verse number 14. But this word is Jesus, and the Bible here is saying that Jesus is the word. So the first pair of things that I want you to see tonight is that Jesus is the word, and thus the Creator. Jesus is the Word, and thus the Creator. That's what the Bible is saying in verse number 3. It says, all things were made by Him, the Word. Okay? Look at Genesis chapter 1. You're saying, what, Jesus was the Creator? I, I thought God uh, created um, the world. Look at Genesis chapter 1, and I'll explain that to you. Look at the, how the Bible starts out. The Bible starts out in the beginning, just like John chapter 1 starts out, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse number two, 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the first thing that I want to point out here is that, you know, God is the creator, but there's two things that you need to understand. The first thing is this. The world was spoken into existence. You'll notice this pattern of, of wording in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story where, you know, this is the first day we're talking about. But when God creates something, it says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So God created the world with what? With his words. He literally spoke the world into existence. And that's how we can say that the word was God, the word was with God, and in the beginning was the word. And we can also say that this is how Jesus created the world. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Go to Colossians chapter 1. You're going to keep your place in Genesis chapter 1 and in John chapter 1. We're going to keep bouncing back um, between those two things. But go to Colossians chapter 1, and let's look at verse number 13. Go to Colossians chapter 1, and look at verse number 13. Colossians 1, verse number 13. We're looking at this idea of Jesus as the Word and thus the Creator of everything. Look at verse number 13, where the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, 13, it says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his, of his dear Son. This is talking about Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus, the firstborn of every creature. Now look at verse number 16, where it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is, and this matches perfectly with John chapter 1, 2, and 3, John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus is the way God the Father created everything. He's the mechanics of how it happened. It was literally spoken into existence. You say, created what? Everything. The, I mean, the Bible says all things were created by him. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, gravity, every law of physics, every single thing that we try to um, search out in this world was created by Jesus Christ, by God speaking his word and Jesus Christ being that power, that word that created everything. Jesus is the spoken word of God, is what the Bible is telling us here. That's who Jesus is. And thus, this is how God created the world. People say, how in the world could you know, God have created everything? He spoke it into existence. His word has power. His word is Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God, and thus the Creator. Turn back to John chapter 1. You're going to keep your place in Genesis chapter 1. There's uh, a lot of interesting things. We're going to keep looking back at Genesis chapter 1. But the second pair of things. So the first pair of things we see is that Jesus is literally the Word of God. He, was, he is God, and he is in the beginning with God, and he was the mechanism. He was the way that God created um, everything, all everything, the universe, all the laws, the principalities, the dominions, everything that we see today. Look at John chapter 1 and verse number 4. John chapter 1, look at verse number 4. The Bible says this. The Bible says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You're like, okay, um, that's a nice saying. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended, comprehended it not. The second pair of things that I want to talk about this evening that Jesus is, is Jesus is the light and the life. So Jesus being the word goes with Jesus being the creator, and Jesus being the light goes with Jesus being the life. 
Okay, you say, what are you talking about? Turn to John chapter 8. We can't even go to all the verses in the Bible that talk about Jesus being the light. Okay, but we're going to go to a few just to show you that it's a common thing in the Bible. So what does that mean? Is this a, a, a spiritual application? Look at John chapter 8 and look at verse number 12. John chapter 8, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Then Jesus, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of what? The light of life. So we see that the light goes with the life. Look at John chapter 9, just one chapter over, and look at verse number 5. Jesus says again in John chapter 9, look at verse number 5. Jesus says, as long as I am the wor in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus here is talking in a spiritual sense, that he is this spiritual light of the world. I mean, look, in Isaiah chapter 9, I'll just read it to you. Darkness... Darkness is, is uh, salvation is light compared to not being saved, being spiritual darkness. Okay, so and that's, the, that's the case that Jesus is using here, talking about being that spiritual light. In Isaiah 9-2, the Bible says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. This is talking about people that are not saved. This is a prophecy of Christ. People that are not saved are walking in the darkness, in the shadow of death. Why? Because John 3, 36 says that the wrath of, wrath of God abideth on them. People that have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, have not trusted on Jesus, have the wrath of God upon them. It's like a great weight, a great shadow of death sitting upon them. Jesus is that light. When you believe or trust on Jesus, that light shines and takes that shadow of death away. That's what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 8 and John chapter 9, saying, I am the light of the world. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. In Psalm chapter 119, verse, actually, you turn to Psalm chapter 119, verse number 105. Turn to Psalm 119, verse 105. What is Psalm 19 about? The longest chapter in the Bible. It is all about what? It is all about loving, studying, and dwelling, and, and pondering on the Word of God. Psalm chapter 119 is all about Jesus. Because Jesus is the Word. Look at Psalm chapter 119. Look at verse 105. Now that you know that Jesus is this light that, that removes the shadow of death from those that have trusted on him, look at Psalm 119, verse 105. Hopefully you see how like, the Bible just completely perfects itself. It fits together. You know, I, There's no way this could have been written by uh, dozens of different people that just were trying to figure this out. I mean, it's a miracle in itself. Look at verse number one, uh, 105 of Psalm 119. The Bible says, Thy word. Who is thy word? David is talking, the psalmist is talking to God. He's saying, thy word, T-H, singular. He's talking to the Lord. He's saying, God's word. Who is God's word? He's talking about Jesus. Is what? Is a lamp unto my feet and a what? A light unto my path. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Jesus and a light are, are completely interchangeable in this verse. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Now, it's interesting because the Bible also says, Jesus also says that once you're saved, you also have a light. You also have a light through what? Through his word, through Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 16. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 16. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the Bible says that once you know we are saved, we have a light. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 8. The Bible says, For we were sometimes, for we were, ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light. Who's he talking to? He's talking about the church at Ephesus. He's talking about these Gentiles who got saved by believing on Jesus. And he's saying, you were in darkness. He's like, but now are ye, talking about them, 
He's like, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He's telling them to go out and, and preach the word of God. This is what he's telling them to do. Walk as children of light. Go out and shine that light, that what? That word. That word of God. So it's our responsibility to go out and shine that light, which is what? The word of God. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is what we're referring to here. So we see that Jesus is this great spiritual light that shines through the darkness. It shines through the shadow of death. It shines through the wrath of God. Here's what's really interesting. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. So we see that Jesus is talking about, John chapter 1 is talking about, you know, Jesus being a spiritual light. But did you know the Bible also says that Jesus is a physical light? Like he's physically light. Like light that shines so we can see stuff. It's super interesting. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. All right, so let's, let's get some end times context as we go to Revelation chapter 21. You've got to remember um, your clues and milestones um, sermon series now, okay? Revelation chapter 21, we are talking about the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem specifically here in Revelation chapter 21. But what has happened so far? What has happened so far? So if we go all the way back to the beginning of the end times, what has happened so far? Let's just review the whole sermon series in like three minutes here. Let's, let's do an end times review in three minutes. So basically, this guy showed up that was predicted in the book of Daniel, this guy called the, the Antichrist. There's many Antichrists. Anybody who's against Christ is an Antichrist, but the Antichrist shows up who makes a covenant with many in the book of Daniel prophesied. This is Daniel's 70th week. He comes, he makes a covenant with many. He, he, um, he sets up the abomination of, de well, actually, he makes a covenant with many. Then in Revelation chapter 6, there's this huge war where he turns his covenant with many into a one world government. Revelation chapter 6 details how that happens. And then we get to Revelation chapter 13, where we see that now there is this one world government. There is all the kings of the earth that are following this Antichrist. And he sets up what? He sets up this image in the temple. He forces people to worship this image. He takes, you know, he makes people take this mark in their right hand and in their forehead. And anybody that doesn't take the mark and worship the image, he hunts down and kills. And this is what ushers in, in Matthew chapter 24, this is what ushers in the Great Tribulation. You're like, how will we know it's the Great Tribulation? Because there are several milestones that have happened. This guy, the Antichrist, has come on the scene. The abomination of desolation has happened. It's not like we're going to miss the mark of the beast. Like all the people saying, like, oh, the vaccine was the mark of the beast. And all, no, no, no. Now, these may be shadows of things to come, but the mark of the beast is going to be specifically something the Antichrist puts in place to worship this image that's in the temple. Okay, so we can watch for these milestones, right? This ushers in the Great Tribulation. How will we know it's Great Tribulation? Because the Bible says in Matthew 24, it'll be worse than any tribulation that's ever happened on the earth to, the, to this point on Christians. Look, that's bad. If you've read about things that have happened to Christians throughout history, from the Jews, from the Romans, from the Catholics, for all the way through the last 2,000 years, it's some terrible stuff. You've got to read it in, 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 in doses. It's so bad. There's a, there's a part in the, in, the, in the Martyr's Mirror, in this book right here. There's a part in this book where it literally says, it literally says that things were getting so bad underneath some of these, these people, that, these Roman emperors, that it's like the imagination of men well, was empty because they, every evil imaginary thing that, the, uh, that men could imagine to do to another man was being done. The Bible says the Great Tribulation will be worse than all that. We're not going to miss that. It's not going to be like, oh, are we in that now? Christians are going to be running, they're going to be hiding, and the Bible says, you know, unless those, times are sh those days are shortened, it's like no one would make it through it. But of course those days are shortened by what? The sun and the moon are darkened in Matthew chapter 24, Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 14, and the rapture happens. So God does cut those days short. He's going to rapture, you know, the believers from the earth at that time. And after he raptures the believers from his earth, literally one hour later, 
He is going to start pouring out his wrath upon everybody that's left on the earth. So it's at that midpoint of Daniel's 70th week, right at that three and a half year period that the rapture is going to take place. We're out of here. Look, there's going to be tribulation that we're going to go through before that. But, you know, God will end it at some point during the great tribulation. He raptures the church, and then we see in Revelation, um, we see the trumpets, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials of God's wrath being poured out on the earth for three and a half more years. All right, after this, what do we have? After God's wrath is poured out, we have the Battle of Armageddon. In Revelation, we have the Battle of Armageddon that happens, and right after that battle, what do we have? We have the thousand, the, the millennial reign of Christ. Christ, um, we come back with Christ, and we rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's going to be a good time. All right? The Bible says that that's going to be a wonderful time. Basically, Jesus is going to come back and say, hey, here's how it's going to look if you'd have done it how I told you. Here's how things will go if you follow the word of God, which is what? Me. So Jesus is going to rule and reign for a thousand years. After that, we have the great white throne judgment. After the great white throne judgment, that's when all the people in death and hell are brought up. All the people that are in hell for that thousand years, anybody that had died is in hell that wasn't saved, is going to be brought up, and they're going to be standing in front of the great white throne judgment. And what are they going to get? They're going to get what they wanted. They're going to get to be judged by their works. And God is going to judge every one of them by their works. Because isn't that what people want today? People that aren't saved today, what do they think? They think they're pretty good. They're going to find out how good they are. They're going to pay for everything that they did. And then the Bible says death and hell are going to be packaged up and cast into the lake of fire. And, you know, the beast, the false prophet, Satan, they're all going in the lake of fire at that point. And then we have Revelation Chapter 21, we have the new heaven and the new earth. All the end time stuff is there. I mean, the, the end time stuff is really not that complicated, the chrono, chronolog, chronology of it, unless you like throw in a bunch of weird doctrines that aren't in the Bible. So, I mean, I basically just gave you the end times in, in four minutes. So after that, we have the new heaven and the new earth. And this new Jerusalem, this beautiful city, is what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 21, look at verse number 17. We have this beautiful city. Everything is done, the end times, the wrath is over. We have the new heaven, the new earth. The Bible is just giving us the example, or giving us the, the, the measurements of the new Jerusalem. It says, you measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold. Can you imagine? Like unto clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious, precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chal chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophorus, the eleventh a jacinth, jath jacinth the twelfth an ameth amethyst. In verse number 21, the 12 gates were, were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I, not, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Who's the Lamb? That's Jesus. And the city had, now this is what I really want to point out to you this evening. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So we have the new heaven, the new earth, and this beautiful city, and the light. There is no sun. The stars, everything fell out of the sky, you know, during the wrath of God, you know, rolled up as a scroll. But Jesus, the Lamb, is the physical light of the city. Jesus lights the city himself. You say, what? How, how does that work? How does that work? Well, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. So Jesus is a spiritual light. We see that. You know, I mean, the Bible says in John chapter 1, you know, that he's the light of the world. It doesn't say, like, he's the spiritual light only of the world. 
The Bible here is saying Jesus is the light. Jesus said, I am the light. We get that that's a spiritual light, but I'm telling you, Jesus is also a physical light. And he's providing physical light in Revelation chapter 21 at the end of everything. But here's another interesting point. Look at Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 2. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2. The Bible says, now, now verse number 2 is right after the earth was created. We're talking about the first day of creation here in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 2. And the earth was without form and void. God hasn't made everything yet. He's just made the heaven and made the earth. And what? Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now go to verse number 14. Now go to verse number 14. So we see that light was the first thing that God put on the earth. But here's what's really interesting. If you look at verse number 14, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day. This is what we would call the sun. And the lesser light to rule the night. This is what we would call the moon. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And in the evening and the morning were, oh, look at this, the fourth day. So the Bible says that God created light on the first day, but the sun didn't exist until the fourth day. So the question is, where did that light come from? It came from the Word. It came from the same place that it comes from at the end. It came from Jesus, who was what? Who was there. Who was there at the beginning and was there creating everything. That light was Jesus. Jesus was there on the first day. That's where the light came from. The sun wasn't even created yet. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is a physical, we're talking about a physical light too. Physical light. This is the first appearance in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 3, where, you know, the first appearance of the glory of God, the, the light of Christ in the Bible. I mean, the depth of the Bible. This is why you don't want an NIV. I mean, you want the real, you want the real words. I mean, how are you going to figure this stuff out? You got, a bunch of, you got a bunch of unsaved, you know, heretics, you know, jumbling it all up. I mean, they're going to wreck all this perfection here. But this is the first appearance of the glory of God in Christ in the Bible. In Genesis chapter, how, how, many, how many verses do we get in the Bible before we see Jesus? Like three? <laughs> it's like right there. So the point is, is that John chapter 1 is talking that Jesus is a spiritual and physical light. Now look, and we've all had discussions like this. We've, we've pulled out whiteboards and we've talked about these types of things. But doesn't it make so much sense now that you know this? Why light is such a mystery to us today? I mean, man, they just can't figure out light. No one can. No one can figure out, like, like I, I, have, I, I think certain things are wrong. I think the theory of relativity is wrong, and I think certain people that had ideas on light are just obviously wrong. They've been proven wrong in experiments. But nobody really has their grasp upon what light, I'm talking physical light here, is really doing. How fast it travels, if it travels faster one way or, or, or the other way, if the two-way speed is the same. I mean, nobody, if it, if it was the same speed a thousand years ago as it is today, if it's the same speed, you know, a million miles away in space as it is right here, nobody really knows. It's almost like it's supernatural, or it's got some supernatural aspects to it. Well, the Bible seems to back that up by saying, you know, Jesus is the light. It makes sense. Look at Psalm chapter 84. Psalm chapter 84. You're like, this is like a mind bender. Yeah, like, well, we don't have to understand everything about God. That's why God is God and we are who we are. Look at Psalm chapter 84. Psalm chapter 84, look at verse number 11. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 84, verse number 11, 
The Bible says, Psalm chapter 84 and verse number 11, it says, For the glory of God is a sun and a shield, and the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Just talking about how God, again, is, is that light, comparing God to the literal sun. All right? But look, turn to Exodus chapter 34. Let me show you one more uh, neat thing about the, the physical light of the glory of God or the physical light of Christ. Okay? Look at um, so in Exodus chapter 34. Go to Exodus uh, chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, and look at verse. So Exodus chapter 34 is the second time that, you know, Moses goes up to get, um, he goes up to the mount to get the, the, uh, the law from God. And, of course, he comes down, and God says, you better get back down there. They're worshiping, uh, you know, idols or whatever. And so Moses says to go take care of business down there. But he goes back up, and he gets the law. Uh, from God, and he's up in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights with God. Look at Exodus chapter 34, and what is God doing? It's interesting because Exodus chapter 34, look at verse number 28. Let's start with uh, verse number 28. It says, He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Neither did, neither did he eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tablets, what? The words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down. So what was he doing for 40 days? and 40 nights. He was receiving the word from God. He was receiving God's word, and he was writing it down on these tablets. Look at verse number 29. It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mount, Moses wist not, meaning he didn't know, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. They were afraid to come by him because he was glowing. He was emanating. He absorbed. He, he absorbed. I mean, we're talking about literal light here. Like his face was literally shining because God was literally speaking the word of God to him, which... The glory of God was, was coming off on Moses, and it, and it showed you, like, how does that physically work? I have no idea. I have no idea how the glory of the physical light of God could transfer to someone's body and, and supernaturally come off um, and, and be seen by other people for a certain period of time. But that's exactly what happened. So, like, it, it, we can't understand it. It is of God. It is God. <laughs> the glory of God, Jesus, gives off actual light. Meaning light is, you know, it's, it's supernatural, which makes perfect sense why we can't figure it out completely on this earth. It's not shocking when you look at it from a biblical perspective. So what do we see with these pairs tonight? We see that Jesus is the Word and the Creator. That's the first pair that goes together. The second pair is that Jesus is the light and the life. Now, here's what's interesting. Go to John chapter 14. Just like, I mean, you say, how does light go with life? Well, it's another beautiful pairing right here because just as you cannot have eternal life without that spiritual light of Christ, you can't, I mean, that, that mirrors the physical because you can't have actual life either without physical light. We would die. If there was not physical light, light warms the atmosphere, it generates all of our weather, it, it makes the plants, uh, gives energy to the plants, would give oxygen off that we breathe. I mean, without light, there's, there's no chance for life on this earth. Look at John chapter 14 and verse number 6. Now this makes sense. Jesus saith unto him, these two pairs that I just told you about, the Word and the Creator and the light and the life now make sense. We look at John chapter 14 in verse number 6 where Jesus says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. We'll get to that in a minute. But what does he say he is? He's the truth and the life. You know what that means? He's the Word and the light which gives life. He's the truth and the life. And then, you know, people always cut off that verse. Whenever you see it on a bumper sticker, they always leave the last part of this verse off. It's really irritating. Because what he, the way goes with the last part of the verse. He says, I am the way. Just, you know, as a, as a side note here, no man cometh to the, uh, unto the Father but by me. 
Jesus is saying here, I mean, that's a divisive statement. People don't like that statement. People don't like the statement that I am the way, the truth, and the life. We understand the truth and the life, but no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way you're getting to heaven is through Jesus. I don't know what's been going on with me going out soul winning lately, but I keep running into all these people that are giving these answers like, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, faith in God. Well, I have faith. Well, all of a sudden, I'm like, does God have a name? What is God's name? And I just want, it's almost like I'm running into people lately where it's almost like they don't want to say the name Jesus. But I got news for you. You're not going to heaven by faith in some, some uh, generic God. It's only through Jesus. That's it. A lady told me the other day, like, well, everybody has their own, you know, uh, their own idea of God, and as long as they're, you know, out there. No. It's only through Jesus. I mean, he is the way. He doesn't say a way, Billy Graham. He doesn't say a way. He doesn't say, well, as long as you feel that, you know, uh, you've, you found God and, and, you know, that's kind of your Jesus. Wrong. It's either through Jesus Christ or you're going to hell. But you're like, what about the guy that fears God? What about the guy that, like, really fears God, but he just doesn't know who Jesus is? This is Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He just, he really feared God. Well, God sent Peter to him. If he is truly seeking, God will send a soul winner to that person. But if Cornelius would have died before Peter got there, Cornelius would have gone to hell. Because just fearing God is not enough. It is believing on Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, the life. It's the only way. Nobody wants to hear that today. But that's the truth of it. The truth of it. Now here's what's interesting. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. A little bit more on this. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 8. Revelation chapter 1, and look at verse number 8. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 8, remember, he was the light at the beginning, and he was the light at the end. And it, it makes a lot of sense now when Jesus says this in Revelation 1, 8, where he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. And if you go back to Revelation chapter 22, he said, you know, it's just talking about the, the new heaven and the new earth. It says, there shall be no night there. There's not going to be night. There's not going to be night there at all. They will, it says they will need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light. How? Through the Lamb. So Jesus provided the actual light at the beginning, and he provides the actual light at the end. Now go back to John chapter 1. Go back to John chapter 1. Go back to John chapter 1. You ever wonder about uh, light and darkness? I mean, why have day and night? You ever think about that? You ever think about why God did that? Why, why did God do the sun and the moon and, and, and light and day? I mean, at the end, it, when we're all on the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem is this beautiful city, there is going to be no night. No one will need a candle. We won't need power plants. That kind of makes me sad. But, I mean, we're not going to need all these things. All the electricians are like, oh. But we're not going to need this stuff. But why did God have light and darkness? There's no night there at the end. You see, the difference is, is that now... Man can choose darkness and light. Man has free will to choose darkness and light. And, and I'm talking spiritually and physically. Both of these work. Because did you know that physical sin, that actual darkness, sin is more prevalent in actual darkness. What is sin? Sin, sin brings the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. That's that shadow of death. But why is sin more prevalent in the dark? Why are bars dark? Why are casinos dark? Why are clubs dark? Why are all these places that just, that just deal in sin, in fornication, in drunkenness, in wickedness, why are they all in the dark? 
Because people don't want to see themselves when they're sinning. People don't want the light shined in situations like that. You ever heard anyone's dad ever say, nothing good ever happens past 10 p.m.? You know, that's true. That's true. I mean, even science will tell you this today. Even studies will tell you this today. Let me read you uh, just a little clip from SciTech Daily. It's talking about even your judgment. Psychology, one of the worst sciences out there, literally recognizes that even your judgment is worse when it's dark. From SciTech Daily, the concern that bad things happen after dark now has science behind it. Or just read the Bible. When we are awake during the wee hours, neurophysiological changes in the brain alter the way we interact with the world, especially actions related to impulse control, reward processing, and high-risk decision-making. If you've ever stayed up late and sent a regrettable tweet, I have never done that. <laughs> Wolfed down a box of cookies, no comment. Polished off another bottle of wine or gone on the late-night QVC shopping spree, you might agree that the mind after midnight is not thinking straight. If you're awake in the middle of the night, it's fair to say that your brain is not functioning at its best. Bad things that happen after dark, the article continues. Homicides and violent crime are more common at night. People are more at risk of engaging in harmful behavior, such as suicide, violent crime, substance abuse at night. Our nighttime food choices at night also tend to be unhealthy as we pursue more carbohydrates, lipids, processed foods, and often consume more calories than we need. A, a study from PubMed said this. A study found that teens who got nine hours of sleep per night had the lowest levels of mental health issues, including moodiness, feelings of worthlessness, anxiety, and depression. Meaning, if a teen gets nine hours or more of sleep a night, they don't have these problems as much as a teen that doesn't sleep as much. Then they'll just make this stupid conclusion that, you know, well, if you just get more sleep, you won't be depressed. But when they, they totally miss you know, the, the spiritual application here that, you know, they say, well, lack of sleep causes depression. No, it's what you're doing when you're not sleeping that's causing depression. It's the substance. You'd think these scientists would get together and at least talk to each other. You know, it's the substance abuse and the poor choices and all these different wicked things that people are getting into in the dark that's causing the anxiety and the depression and the moodiness and the, the suicidal thoughts and all these things. It's what they're doing besides sleeping. It's what they're doing what? It's what they're doing in the darkness. This is why you need the Bible, or you're just a complete idiot if you don't, you don't read the Bible. I mean, if you, I mean just, a, just an application for yourself. If you're staying up all night, like, what are you doing that for? If you're up, if you're up, you know, to the wee hours of the, of the night, you know, I, I would ask, like, what are you doing? Because it's probably not something good, is what the Bible is telling us. But the point is, back to the point of the sermon, we have a choice now. We have a choice of light or darkness. We have a spiritual choice. That's why the Bible says, in John chapter 1, that God gave us the power to become sons of God. By what? By believing on his son. By believing on Jesus. We can spiritually choose the light, or we can embrace the dark. We can embrace the shadow of death. I mean, this is the, this is the depth uh, of the Bible. Let's, let's continue reading here. Look at verse number, um, look at verse, well, I don't know where we left off. Let's just finish this out. It says, there was a man sent from God. Now this is going to make more sense to you. Now that we've really dissected this whole thing. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We're talking about John the Baptist here. The same came for a witness to bear witness of what? Of the light. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, talking about John the Baptist, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that come into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. There we see the creator again, and the world knew him not, meaning the world didn't accept Jesus as the light. Look at verse number 11. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. The, the vast majority of the Jews, the mainstream Jews, did not receive Jesus. Jesus. If you didn't get that from the book of Acts, um, you know, that's who was chasing around Paul the entire time. It wasn't the Romans at that point. Look at verse number 12. But as many as received him, look at this, he gave the power to become the sons of God, lowercase s, to become adopted children 
into God's family, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. Notice, it's not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, meaning there's nothing that we did with our flesh, our body, to get that. All we did was believe on Jesus Christ, on the what? The light, the creator, the word that gave us life. And it, verse number 14 wraps it all up right here. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, and there it is, truth. Jesus is the word. We see Jesus here is the word, and he's the creator. That matches up with the truth in John chapter 14 and verse number 6. And then, you know, that word became flesh, and it's that light that gives us life, both, look, physically through the creation, and also, more importantly, that spiritual everlasting life. That's who Jesus is in the first 14 verses of the book of John. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. We'll finish up um, John next week, John chapter 1 next week. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for just this beautiful explanation of who Jesus Christ is um, in the Bible. I thank you for just...